Hi, it's Moira Gamble from our Permaculture Life and the Permaculture Education Institute and it's my great pleasure today to be in the garden of Angie and Andy Polkey here in West Wales. So I've been in West Wales for a few days now. Mm -hmm. and um, It's been great to have you here. Oh, it's been wonderful. Yeah. 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 So Angie and I met about 20-something years ago. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I was actually here in Wales and, and I did a talk and Angie was there and actually a few years earlier than that in Perth. We kind of crossed paths almost at the Perth <laughs> International yes. Conference, our yeah. permaculture conference. And then we've both been working in Uganda lately doing um, doing permaculture teaching and support work over there. At the but same school, at the same school different time. time. <laughs> and so finally, after many WhatsApp chats and yeah. what, WhatsApp chats, chats, that's so hard to say, yeah. and uh, Skyping calls and emails, here we are together again, which fantastic. is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. Fantastic. So, so um, Angie and Andy have a beautiful permaculture garden that they've been working on for about 22 years. And so mm -hmm. we thought we might go for a bit of a wander around and yeah. hear about what it is, but also hear about sort of while we're wondering about the sort of permaculture work that you do, because you do a lot of teaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah so I do. Okay, we can move here specifically. And then if anyone can hear that tapping in the background, it's the chickens. Yeah, so maybe should we walk this way? We can <laughs> leave the chickens to have further, their dinner yeah. with. <laughs> Angie just fed yeah. them. Well, interestingly, Andy and I used the um, permaculture design process to design our way from rented accommodation and jobs that were becoming less satisfactory, let's put it that way, um, to have a new life. Right. And I won't give you the long story, but the, the short story is that uh, after using that design, when we did our observation and, our, and looking at what we wanted and researching our options, we ended up homing down on this little patch of Wales. And one of the reasons we, we homed down on this patch of Wales is because I knew that I wanted to teach. Yeah. And just up the road, some of you might have heard of the, it's quite a famous centre for alternative technology in Wales. And we didn't want to step on their patch. And then further south in Wales, there is a, like, it's a really, really strong organic movement mm, began really years nice. and years ago. So kind of like strategically, we decided to put ourselves here. It's uh, adjacent to a wonderful nature reserve, which mm. is just beyond our garden. And that's what, how many hundred um, oh, acres? I, oh, so oh that would be Andy can tell you that. Yeah, it's a significant to manage area. It. Yeah, it is. Wetland area. Yeah, big then, national nature reserve, yeah, which is significant, you know, in, internationally and, and nationally mm. important. We found this little piece of paradise and I knew that I wanted to teach. Yeah. And it was uh, basically um, a blank page because mm. it was sheep pasture, like a lot of the land around here. Yeah. And it meant that we didn't have to fit around anybody else's design. No. Um, mm. It meant that we could start with uh, this blank page, which was actually really quite scary because we'd already done back garden permaculture yeah, right. up until that and point. Also, how many acres have you got here? It's only three and a half. But, but still, from enough. going from a backyard to three and a half yeah. acres. Yeah. Even an acre is a significant amount when you kind of manage it yeah. you know, really well. And it? I'm grateful for the time that we had in the urban area yeah, because right. we had a rented house and we had a like a postage stamp back garden. Yep. So that meant that the the you know the design criteria for that was one, it's small, two, it's got to be free or incredibly cheap yep. because we were in a rented accommodation. Right. We were thinking long term, mm. but we didn't want to invest a lot of financial resources yeah, yeah. in it. So we I'm glad to have had that experience because mm. as a teacher, of course, yeah, a lot of people could say, oh, it's okay for you. You've got three and a half yes, acres. Yes, that's right. You say, well, actually, there's, you know, there's many different ways that you can do yes. it and yeah. in all different environments and contexts. And, you know, you're doing it here in a, a cool, wet environment. And I'm doing it in a subtropical, sometimes, you know, drought environment. Yeah. And permaculture applies to all those different Absolutely. contexts. Yeah. 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 So where are we here right now? Well, in we're in um, what we like to call the Southern Forest Garden. So it's mm. not like a... Um, a, a kind of heavily designed forest <laughs> garden and when you look around you'll see there's plenty of grass mm -hmm. um, not a lot of ground covers um, but we've got two other forest gardens which are in slightly more optimal aspects mm. and this one is in the, although it's in the south it's it's quite a lot of shady big trees around mm. and we wanted to use this as a way to through. yeah of course it's it was a way for us to explore some more unusual Mostly, mostly tree species, yeah. um, things things that you don't normally get as in a food 
uh, garden or right. an orchard so what garden. are some of those things that well you've some done of them here? would be like this is um you're coming up to and you'll see around. in a moment this is a meddler Right, tell us about a, a meddler. meddler. Well, something a med you grow in Queensland. <laughs> no, well, it's related to um, the apple family and it's um, got a, a small brown fruit. And what's unusual about the fruit is that you have to, it's called bletting. You have to let it, some people say rot, right. which is a bit unsavoury sounding, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, like basically the flesh has to soften. Right. Okay. And so you wait until it's got frosted and, yeah, and, it, and, right. it's, and, it, and then it goes like a, a, a dark brown, creamy, fudgy texture. Oh, wow. That sounds yeah, nice. Yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful. Wow. And we're very fond of it, and, and it makes a wonderful, um, so like. Do you a, eat it straight like that, or do you do something? You else can with scoop it? it out and eat okay, it, like right. fudgy. And, so how big is it? Oh, uh, like that, about that size, okay. sort of plum size, yeah, I right. guess, nice. or very, or like a crab apple, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Gosh. Yeah. And then oh, we've got various cornices day. in here, and um, sea buckthorn, yeah. and a lot of hawthorn species that are from North America because in the UK right. we have two wild hawthorn okay. species yep. and there hasn't been a lot of what well, well, there's been very little breeding mm. effort gone into yep. in, uh, as Martin Crawford would tell you and, and Ken Fern in yep. the UK there hasn't been a lot of breeding effort gone into these more unusual fruiting mm. trees. Yeah right. Now do you eat that? Do you eat the young leaves of the hawthorn? Is that yep. you can do? You can, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And that's one something that people use a lot in hedges, isn't it? Yeah. So something I've yeah. seen all these beautiful little young leaves coming up. Yes. I thought that looks edible. And yeah. I was looking it up. It's called and bread and cheese. I can tell you, it doesn't it. taste like bread and cheese. No, I, I had a it, nibble and I thought, yeah. I'm not quite sure yeah, about but this. If you're desperate, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it's there, isn't it? I mean, at the moment, there's lots of foods. The nettles are coming up. You've got the wild garlics. You've got the the hawthorn yeah. bread and bread and cheese. Is yeah, it bread, bread and cheese? So there's lots of wild foods around. There certainly is. And, you know, mm. I've been thinking about this because a lot of people talk about the hungry gap. Yeah, right. And we're in it now, yeah. conventionally. Right. And I'm thinking, well, I don't really feel like I'm in the hungry gap. No. Because we've got, um, we, well, as you know, mm. we've just cooked our last storage pumpkins. Yes, delicious soup. soup. Yeah. yeah, so that's a long time, you know, right into it April. Is, it? Yeah. Um, and, and you've got the leeks and potatoes. Yeah, and we've got sauerkraut. Yeah, and I just um, harvest lots of... Um, out of the polytunnel, I harvest some um, some greens, some tree spinach, and, yeah, yeah some and, tree spinach. and also some sorrel, yeah, chives, yeah, um, lots of yeah. things. And over there, yeah. you can see the little pink flower that's, in the hedgerow. That's, that's monsha. Let's um, go over there. And that's uh, that's a really nice little salad plant. And it kind of we let it naturalise around oh, I'm the place. Have to turn around so we can yeah. see that. So let me just crouch down yeah. and show people here. So this is like a little edible. Um, leaf oh, and flower. I think flower. I call that miner's lettuce. Is yeah, it? yeah. I right. believe it's called moncha. I might somebody on there might say she's got that wrong, but no. I think it's moncha or pink purslane. Pink purslane. I think right. so. I think so. It tastes delicious. I had a bit of a nibble of that yesterday. Actually. Yeah, it is. It's really nice, and you yeah. can see it's doing well on it. And we let these types of plants yep. find their own place. So we nice. will have introduced this somewhere. Yep. But then it finds its own yeah, place. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So self-seeding mm. things happening mm. all over. Mm. That's wonderful. And like you say, the nettles are really great because particularly earlier in the year, they've got a lot of iron in them. Yes, of course. So they make fantastic teas. Yeah. And lots of soft, soft fruits around everywhere. Yeah. That's something that we don't have in our, our sort of... We have some wild raspberries and that's probably about it. Yeah. So to come here and see all these different sorts of the currants and the, all the different sorts of soft fruits you have. It's very exciting. That's one of the great advantages of a cool temperate yeah, climate that's right. is the soft fruit is really yeah. superb. Yeah, and you've got, in, so we're about to come up to a bit of an orchard area. What have you got growing in here? Yeah, well, we've got, the, this is more conventional apples and plums. Right. Uh, we're, our elevation is about 200 metres above sea level. Right. okay. Um, which means that we're on the margins of some of the top fruit that you can grow. Right, okay. Um, but apples are fine. Yep. Um, and plums are good as long as we don't get too strong frosts at certain times of the year in the um, spring. You've also got some really lovely um, espaliered pears along yes. your rock wall. Yeah, you? I was then going to say that. Because yeah. So when we came here, we hadn't lived in this climate before, this, this particular, you know, weather and microclimates over here in the west because i come from the east so we had to learn all over again yeah right and talk to local people yeah. and do our research and also bear in mind i think this is what a lot of people don't realize that when we first arrived there wasn't the internet no of course <laughs> not. that's right 
It's so, um, oh, so much got, different, isn't it? Yeah. So just before we head out to the to the geese, <laughs> <laughs> um, what's happening behind us here? Well, behind us is one another forest garden. Um, Andy and I are both ecologists. Yeah, right. So, and our one of our important yields for us is to have habitat for wildlife. Um, and although we have lots of guests and, and volunteers, etc., basically there's two adults living mm. here on this land. So we can grow enough food for us and guests. Yep. And, and then, as always with permaculture systems, the, the rest of it is actually supporting biodiversity. Yeah, yeah. And so you've got a lot of flowery things, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. yeah, so we've got a forest garden here, surrounded Beautiful. by a, a, a willow hedge that I grew from little sets. Oh, nice. And then a lot of ground covers that are great for bees. Yep. Um, yeah. I don't know what's it like in Australia because we're having a real problem with pollinators. They've declined well, enormously in the well, UK. Well, pollinators have declined enormously as well. But you know, permaculture gardens like this, you know, it, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. 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 yeah definitely. Yeah. Just some of the uh, audience here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and so why do you keep these lovely ones? Well, these are our mobile lawn mowers. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so where do they mostly live? They mostly live on, well, wherever there's grass. Right. Because that's their main food. Yep. Out here um, in this Yeah, and in the field area. as well. Yep. And they, they supply us with eggs, which is brilliant. Those eggs are enormous. Yeah, Can no. you just kind of show us how big? They're about that big oh, they're yeah. three times the size of a, of a hen's egg yeah, yeah they're amazing yeah, aren't yeah, they? yeah yeah they are yeah and yeah. what do they taste do they taste similar or? Yeah, yeah i would say they're, they're they're very rich and creamy yeah in fact um tomorrow we've got a lamp to permaculture group meeting which morag is going to come yeah, to it might be another budget. film yes maybe um so. and they make fantastic egg custard oh, so that's my plan okay. is to make egg Sounds custard good. tonight lovely ready to take tomorrow beautiful yeah yeah Great. Now, there's something very interesting that you're doing in this field, and I would love for you to show us is these these ditches, which is kind of sort of a different way of approaching water than what I do in my place, which is more the swale concept yes. of actually slowing down the water and sinking it in. So let's just turn around and see if we can kind of get this behind us. There yeah. we go. Okay. Okay. So like behind angry. us here, we have these trenches. Now, what's going on with these trenches? Well, I, can't, I suppose they are kind of a little bit different to normal and experimental, but after years and years of observation, mm. uh, we've been on this land for 22 years, we know that the climate is changing, yeah. and we know for certain that um, you can tell even from the plants that are growing here, the rushes that have come into the field, and other species mm. that, that this is a, a wet, the winters are definitely getting wetter. Yeah, right. Okay. And... We, we don't want to manipulate, we don't want the land to not be what it intrinsically is, yes, obviously. Yeah. You know, you, you, we don't want to change that, we want to listen to it and yeah. work with it. Um, but on the other hand, we were observing that we were getting very much stagnant water right. at the top right. over the winters. Wow, okay. And we, this is a wildlife meadow in which we've planted very, very widely spaced apple trees mostly mm -hmm. on on big rootstock right so apart from the forest gardens we have these big these are old, like an old traditional right agro forestry yeah, if okay. you like yeah. um so we graze this uh, in a sort of holistic grazing mob grazing way with, with our neighbors animals right yeah and sheep sheep yep. yeah because that's all we can get but by doing it in a in a holistic grazing, planned grazing way, we can get the best benefits yeah, of great. having the sheep without yeah. having to have them all the time. Yes, that's right. It's um, very lucky to have yes. them just over the fence, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Excuse me, can yeah. I borrow your sheep for a minute? Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. Right. Okay. Well, he's, our neighbour's very accommodating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we said to him about it, and he said, well, just put a gate in. Oh, and you well, can let them in when you so want. so lovely, isn't it? So on this small, yeah. this is only like a half a hectare now, because right. we have a woodland yeah. on the other bit. Right. Uh, we've had 170 sheep in here. Wow, okay. But you only have them in for a few days. Yeah, and that would do a great job on it when I yes. just my hand to make it more steady. Um, but the ditch, let me get back to the ditch. The ditch, yes. Is that, yeah, in a, in a dry climate, in a drier climate, you would want to capture that water. Yeah. For us in West Wales, where our average rainfall is, do you do inches? Inches or centimetres, yeah, either way. Well, we, anything between 50-odd to 70 inches. Right, so that's about one and a half so metres, two, two metres. Two metres, yeah. That is a lot uh, of water. With cooler temperatures, remember. Yeah, yeah. Much cooler temperatures. So you don't get the evapotranspiration. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. So our, our, we we were thinking about whether, how much, obviously minimal input for maximum yeah. benefit. Yeah. So what could we do 
that would sl would slowly allow the water to come down further down the field. Right. At the same time, um, most people around here, when they're planting apple trees, plant them on mounds. Right. Okay. Because apples don't like mounds. to have their feet in the water. Down below here, there's yeah, one on there's the mound. Yeah, there's a lot of mounds. So. Andy was wanting to actually find some soil that yep. he could use. Oh, okay. So then we thought about having a, a ditch system. And if we hadn't been using the soil, obviously we would have had little banks and we yes, could have grown okay, things on right. the banks, like with a typical swale. Sure, yeah. But all our soil has gone into the mounds on which yeah. the apples are growing. So it's a bit hard to see from where you're sitting at the moment, but what's happening is that this is not like a swale on contour. This is actually slightly coming down. So this one comes down here and then it goes down here. It's kind of like zigzagging through the field. So it's this gentle movement of the water through the landscape rather than trying to sort of stop it and sink it right up the top here because you're saying you're getting waterlogging and you yeah. can see from, from the reeds in the middle of the, in the field here right up on the top actually how much that is happening. So, yeah. so that's... I just thought I'd explain that because it's a bit hard to see. Yeah. You know, I'm imagining if, people sitting there on their screens going, what, what is going, going on? on there? Yeah, they look, yeah, you think, well, why are they trenching everywhere? The thing is, yeah, we've just come, come past some of the forest gardens. They have the same system, right. but on a smaller scale. And because okay. they've matured, you yeah. can't see them. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we've got the same ditching. We, we only did it retrospectively because when we first came, we weren't, you know, although we did all our observations, it was quite a while before we planted fruit trees. Nevertheless we didn't make our mounds big enough. Right. And so we had to look, because nobody else was, you know, people are doing it now, but they yeah, weren't right. doing it. It's yeah, so you're ask. kind of learning along the way. And no and internet. Then... <laughs> yes, no internet. <laughs> yeah. so, and no forest garden books, no. apart from Robert Hart. No, that's right. And so now there is. Yeah. So there's Martin Crawford's one, and there's also Thomas Ramirez's yeah. new one. Yep, yep. And Patrick Whitefield's. Patrick Whitefield's, of course, that's and, been around for a long time. And the edible forest gardens from yep. North America. The, yes, that, those that's two that's amazing books. books. Yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. So there's quite a lot now, yeah. which is fantastic. Yeah. But there's nothing beats, actually coming and visiting different forest gardens you know since I've been in in Britain I've actually come to many forest gardens it's been fantastic yeah it's really been fantastic yeah and it seems like it's an idea that's taken off yeah you know in terms yeah. of actually yeah. growing things differently you sort of have the sort of from the Mr McGregor garden style to actually these beautiful polycultural you know amazing places that are quite different quite beautiful really mm. lovely and diverse and yes yeah, habitat. And yeah. Oh, yeah, very multifunctional. Mm. I think that one of the things we've learned, having been with it for so long, mm. especially talking to, say, maybe new forest gardeners, yeah. you know, the two principles that come to mind for me are, are the responding creatively yes. to change and accepting feedback. Yeah. Because, because we didn't have a, a how-to manual, we... Yeah, well, obviously we knew how big the trees were going to get from mm. their rootstocks, etc. But, you know, there are things that we, we overplanted. And I think mm. a lot of people do that in the yes, first case. Right, yep. They overplant. We didn't allow for access paths for yes, us or anywhere yes. to sit. Yes, right. or anything. Just filled it all up yeah. with beautiful diversity. And then yes. went, oh, hang on, I'm part of that diversity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I so think that's what an important we've done, point. Yeah, and what, we, what we've done over the, over the recent years is actually taken stuff out. Yeah, right. Okay. And, and, and luckily for us, in some ways, um, thing, it would be things that haven't done so well. Yeah, I right. mean, we t took our best shot at what we thought would do well here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we've, we've thinned out and we've lowered the... We've got, it's quite a windy spot here, yeah, as yeah. you know, Should coming we go off for the bog. Walk? Should we keep yeah, walking? We have to go and fall in the ditch. <laughs> Maybe show people <laughs> the view down there. Oh, okay, yeah. So you can see the outlook, which is the... The National Nature Reserve oh, and the wetland, know, that's, yeah. a, that's a bog, basically. Yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. I'm not sure if you can see that clearly through that. I might have to take another picture during the day and sort yeah. of put it over the top so people can see. Yeah, yeah. so it's... Should, it's we, all, should we wander through the... Is it through the, through the woodland? Do you reckon we should yeah. go down there? Yeah, I think yeah. so. And um, I think the wind has dropped a little bit and we're on the southern part of the property, which is... Yeah, you know, not catching the wind quite so much. But you've done a um, lot of work to actually try and manage the wind. So, what are have. some of your key strategies for kind of wind breaks? I suppose in yeah. your landscape here. Well, I think we we started off with the the hedges that bounded the property, yep. which were um, originally would have been livestock hedges. So they're quite thorny. Whoops! <laughs> <laughs> Falling <laughs> a ditch you there. Um, and then we've then we've ob obviously observed, researched initially, and then observed where the wind is coming from at different times of the year. I'm going to mind this. Dish this <laughs> yeah, time. and then looked the, at the how we could put laughing. in yeah how we could put in internal hedges. But one thing you might show viewers is that 
basically we've also widened uh, a lot of farmers around here their hedge line is their fence line right okay and therefore the sheep have access to the hedge yeah and that makes the hedge very gappy yes okay um and, it, and it's 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 because the farmers with a fence, they don't need the hedge really very right. much as a livestock barrier and, anymore. And I, I heard, was it you or was it Andy telling me that that the, the area of the field that, that the farmers get subsidised is based on the yeah. actual area of the grass, yes. not, not including the hedge. So yes. the hedges are actually getting thinner or disappearing in yeah. places. And all farmers take them out. Yeah, or they take right. trees out. At the moment, with the regulations at the moment, it's just really daft because, you know, this hedge now is at least two metres wide. Yeah, yes. But a farmer would be penalised for that. Which is crazy. It is crazy. So, I mean, this is really, these these trees that are here and these hedgerows are really the corridors for wildlife, aren't they? I yeah. mean, you don't, there's not much else really apart from, well, I can look in the distance and it's, and it's mostly the hedgerows and little copses of trees. Yeah. And unless you have them, yeah. it's, it's quite... Yeah. disastrous isn't yeah. it anything that needs cover anything that is scared of being yeah. eaten by a red kite or yeah, something right. like pounce on it needs these corridors to move through the landscape yeah. and i've actually noticed you have a you do have a lot of predatory birds which is phenomenal yeah i heard that the uh, what was it the red kite was endangered was it and yeah. it's come back it was one of the things that, you know, like I told you, we designed our, we used permaculture to help design our move to Wales, but ultimately something's got to feel right, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And when we viewed this property, I had heard of this bog, Tregaran bog, because I'm a bit of a bird watcher. Right. And I had, in my imagination, had imagined this mystical and mysterious place where the red kite had hung on to about just a handful of pears. Mm. Uh, everywhere else it was persecuted. Gosh. to extinction and, and why um, was it persecuted what was it what, why were people because people thought um that it took like lambs and, and ate things that they it's a scavenger really but i can't mm. imagine it could lift a lamb no it couldn't no, no it couldn't like a no, little it bunny couldn't. little baby bunny rabbit yeah. maybe yeah and it may have been in the heyday of gamekeeping right. and and people wanting to seeing any kind of raptor as a threat yes okay because you know, they're, they're a bird of prey yeah yeah um, and so we're in the midst of your, sorry, you're telling a story about birds there. I'm, I was, I yeah, was, yeah, well, I was finished. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, because it was a mystical area bog that mm. I knew of from, you know, I, I knew it before I even came here. Right. And then when we found this property overlooking it, mm. and it ticked all our permaculture yeah, boxes. Right. yep. Um, because we used Max Lindiger, yeah, right. uh, who designed Crystal Walks, yep. where you live. Yep. He kindly gave us his, 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 checklist, his yep. checklist, and we adapted it for Wales. Yep. Um, and used it to, to as objectively as we could, because yeah. I, you know, properties can you can get very emotional about properties mm. for the wrong reasons. Yes, right. And so I think once we ticked off the things that we wanted, like the the altitude, the soil, yeah, you know, the aspect, yeah. all the things that a permaculturist would yeah. want, um, then it had to feel right. It yeah. still had to feel yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. And uh, and they've created this beautiful woodland in the midst of it as well. Yeah. So tell me what's going on in this. Well, this area. is um how many trees did you plant and what have you planted and Well, it was um it's half a hectare. It's a small wood and it was a response Well, I suppose the thing that galvanizes into doing it was for the millennium. Right. Yeah, because you know, it's just like it's sort of symbolic yeah. in a way. Yeah. And we knew we wanted to plant the wood. Mm. And we're both ecologists, so previous to this, we had really only visited mature woods. Yeah. If you're a nature lover, yeah. you tend not to go to a young wood. No, no. And we had gone to, we discovered that there's a lovely place in this area where you were teaching yesterday called Denmark Farm yeah. Conservation Centre. Yeah. And when we first arrived, we went to visit them and saw a woodland that they planted specifically for nature. Mm -hmm. um, and the trees were only nine years old, but it actually felt quite like a woodland yeah, yeah. and we were kind of bowled over by it yeah so we we um invited volunteers to come and help us we also restored the hedgerows sorry that we right. came past yep. so that's why they're now two meters wide yeah. they weren't when we came right okay and we researched again because i mean you can design a woodland for lots of different outputs obviously but for us the 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 first thing was to make sure that it was ecologically appropriate yeah. for this land yeah. and this climate so it's very much modeled on what you would it would might have been here years and years and years ago okay. before it became sheep pasture right and so how long ago do you think this area was cleared 
the past, yeah. Like how many years ago was this? Probably actually? hundreds of years. Yeah, right. Because the property is, you know, at least two hundred years old, yeah. and it was a. F we know that because there are records, and because it was a farm, a small yes, right farm. So yeah, hun I would say probably hundreds of hundreds of years, hundreds of years, if not longer. Yeah, because yeah. you know, there's when was most of the forest clearing done in Wales? Do you know? Well, Just thousands of years it started in the yeah. Bronze Age. Yeah, um, I couldn't be specific about how much it came. To when it came to this area, mm. but the Enclosure Act, of course, was in the 1800s. Right. In Britain, we have something called the Enclosure yeah. Act, which meant that land that would previously been open and available, like, like a lot of the common yeah. land as well, yeah. was was really taken yes, right. by by the landed gentry yes. and, and enclosed, and poor people were kept off. Yes, right. So I don't know how much this was. Sometimes that you can research the boundaries and you can research the hedges mm. and try and find out whether they are what they call ancient hedgerows yeah right um from a long time ago okay yes yeah. amazing amazing history you know it's just been yeah. it's a completely different way of looking at the land than you know in australia yes yeah <laughs> yeah and so there was actually something just to sort of move from the woodland conversation to the commons conversation because yeah. yesterday you were talking with some people about the commons mm. And that there are there are still many commons that exist, mm. and that they're actually protected commons, and they're commons for that people in a village can still use. Yes. So how does that work? Because we don't have them in Australia. That kind of legislation yeah. didn't actually reach our country. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I realised talking to you and telling other people about that, my my history is a little bit weak on it. But what I do know is that there is common land mm -hmm. um, in in Wales. And there's a lot of small pockets in this county, and mm. there's a lot of really big ones right. further south. Yeah. And the tradition would be that the commoners, mm -hmm. so the people who live in certain properties yeah. around that land, have a, have an entitlement. Right. Um, but the the common has to be unfenced, mm -hmm. and the number of animals is is usually agreed, right. so that they don't over of course over yeah. over, over over crop it, if yeah. so to speak. So is there is there a chance to actually look at those commons slightly differently in terms of maybe looking at sustainable overlays or you mm. know regenerative farming overlays? Is that yes. kind of happening? Conservation farming overlays, or is it still like how are they managed? Is well, there... a quite a lot of them have been abandoned, right? Because um, you know they they are that that kind of tradition of commoning yep. has uh, people have got less interested mm. in it there are some brilliant commoners around who are still trying and they they're trying to maintain the tradition mm. even though it's very hard for them economically right because you've got to remember that our whole economic system and globalization and the meat trade apparently wales imports as much lamb as it exports yeah it's crazy well this it? is crazy isn't yeah, it yeah so the economics of it makes it even harder mm. for commoners um, because they don't own the land. No, right. So I don't even know if they get the agricultural subsidies. I'm not quite sure oh, okay, about that. okay, which would change things as well. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? So some's been abandoned. Mm. Um, but nature conservation bodies, uh, like some of the ones I've worked for, do have an interest in getting them back into good heart. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that you can have a, a sustainable and traditionally sourced meat product for those who want to yeah. eat meat. Um, and the, also, of course, the, the animals are doing a great job in maintaining that habitat. Yeah. And reducing, I think I also said that one of the problems with these abandoned commons is that they can become a huge fire risk. Yes, which is really interesting because I never thought of Wales as a, a bush yes. fire risk. Yes, I know, I know, I know, we're getting there. Oh, we're getting there. And Do you know something that um, Hugh um, from Hugh's nursery told me earlier today when I was over at his place was that um, his spring went dry last summer. Yeah, yeah. And he said it never it. had gone dry before. And so this whole idea that that whales can have bushfires, whales can run out of water. Yeah, you know, it's quite extraordinary. Like it's yeah. quite different. You know, it everyone is. was saying we have so much water and we're always green, but yet there's another. Yeah, you know, it's in it. it's things are changing on the landscape. They are changing, and farming in Wales is is definitely going to change. Mm. You know, it will change, and and the question is, can, can we do it in a way that holds the traditions? Yeah, yeah, and, and is respectful of yes. the of the culture because yeah. it's it's not the farmer's 
personal fault that we've got to this point no. but the the land that's been abandoned does have a huge opportunity yeah. and it may not always be that those opportunities are for mm. grazing it may be that they're for tree crops yeah yeah uh, or i was future. even thinking you know like what's the possibility of of a of a community setting up one of those commons as a as a like a demonstration of a potential sustainable farming yes. system for for the region maybe yes yeah I don't know. And there are some there are some projects in in yeah, the wings right. waiting in the wings, um, looking mostly where they come from communities. They're coming from um, trying to get support from the Welsh government because okay, the Welsh right. government is very, you know, it's, it's pro. It doesn't always do what it says, but it is very pro in principle, sustainable. Yeah, it sounds design like it from, yeah and, and development with the one planet development and yes. all sorts of things. Yes. Yeah, 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 great. And so, I'm really interested to just to hear a little bit about. You know, you've talked about how you use permaculture to design your move here and that you've started doing teaching. So so permaculture is very much part of your your work life as well as your personal life? It's just the way we are. Yeah, I right. wouldn't even say it's part of or <laughs> so it's get, very much part don't. of. It's like, it's it just like is. There, there isn't any other way. Is no, there? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it informs everything yeah. I do. And it doesn't matter whether I'm teaching because apart from permaculture teaching I also do some conservation teaching yeah. and organic gardening yeah. but, you know I might be teaching you know habitat creation but it's always through the lens of permaculture yeah, right. yep and also you've been involved in um with the um the transition town movement extinction mm-hmm. rebellion mm-hmm. Um, all sorts of things I mean it, yeah. you, a lot of um community-based programs so it's it, it is about how you live your life, how you've got here, how mm. and how you interact with your whole community, and it's through that lens of permaculture. Yeah, it certainly is. Yeah. And, and what's really thrilling is that it's all happening. It's really happening by itself now. Yeah. When we first came, yeah, I can tell you, I, it was quite lonely. Yeah, We'd moved right. to our rural idyll. Yes. But keep saying no internet <laughs> but, you know how do you connect with people yeah, yeah. if they're living up long tracks yes that's right and it's wet sometimes yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know you're at home yeah, and like until imagine. we taught the first myself and three others co-taught our first pdc here in 2000 right and that's when the lampeter permaculture group formed okay and you know to start with it was a group of us that were really very very you know working on our own properties mm, yep uh, and just supporting each other to do that. Yep. But since then, you know, it's it's um, it's it's expanded to include outreach, yep. uh, both with seed seed swap days and apple days and yeah, all sorts great. of other things. Yep. We now have a local seed library. I met them today. Yep. Yep. And you know, this, this is happening without us having to make it happen. Yeah, fantastic. It's, it's got a it's, life. It's, yep. Yeah, it's become a um, it's become a, a, a an attractive area for people yep. to come here. Well, actually, some uh, some of the people I met today at the Lampeter People's Market were saying, "Oh yes, we migrated here because this is West Wales, and because it's a place where people come to live a more simple and connected life." Yeah, and we were attracted to move our lives here. Yeah, because of that. Yeah, so. This is, there is this kind of cultural emergence happening here, isn't there? Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely, definitely. And it's so thrilling to see it. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, I'm feeling a bit like a, dare I say it, almost like a slight elder yes. of the permaculture movement. We'll step and, into and that. Like, yeah. yeah, and it's yeah. great to just think, God, I don't have to work quite, you know, yeah, like, yeah. you know, input. Yes, it's yeah, right. Yeah, there's, yeah. And you know, I think it's important too to realise that when it's time to sort of, to be able to step back. This is like, the, it's like in a pioneer system, in nature isn't it yeah you know that you know the pioneers who start programs you know you know you're very much an initiator of many programs and I'm getting the sense of you you're there at the start of so many things yeah and then they get to a point and then other people kind of move in and keep them going and then you're off starting something else and yeah. <laughs> it just keeps moving like yeah. that yeah, yeah. It's, it's a it's a it's a, it's important to recognize one's role in things yeah. like that isn't yeah, it, it is. you know and, yeah. and when to let go and we yeah. really enjoy I'm so enjoying other families coming into the area, being attracted to the area, yeah. and young people as yeah. well, woofers, yeah. etc., coming into yeah, the area. Right. We have people come to the contact the permaculture group and say, "We're thinking of moving to the area. Can we come on your permaculture day?" Oh, brilliant! And then they can instantly meet twenty or thirty yes. other people. Yeah, that's right. And get a more rounded view of what's going on yeah, in the area. And get a sense of the community and how they might yeah. fit. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah that's great. Wow. Should we just go quickly into your vegetable garden area? Oh, yeah. And then um, 
And then I think maybe maybe we could go inside because my hand is almost <laughs> frozen to this. You're not used camera. to it. <laughs> I'm trying oh, really hard to well. be all rug, rugged up and yes, everything. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> so the best way is probably going to be back through that gate and okay. upset the geese again. All right. <laughs> What we were, as we walk past though, you might just be able to see this little bit of a wall. Should we go past the espaliers? Sure, let's that do that. That would be good, wouldn't it? Because I'll have think... to unlock the gate, but um, just to keep the geese out, that's what that's for. We retrofitted the houses. We haven't spoken much about that, No, have we? we haven't spoken about yeah, the house. Yeah, no, well, when we came, it's, uh, it, we, we, we didn't want to live in a caravan. We yeah. knew that we weren't the sort of people to spend well, years in a caravan yeah. do it, doing up. Well, I won't okay, bother to do it up again. Um, Years in the caravan, so we bought this sort of unsympathetically modernised Welsh house. Oh, very old property, like yeah. hundreds of years old. Um, but then we gradually retrofitted it. Yeah. So did you put the conservatory on yeah. in the front here? I like to call that a passive solar space. Passive solar space. It's beautiful <laughs> inside. Else you know, for me, it, I go in there and it's nice and warm. You know, know. Got the thermal mass of the floor and it's just really lovely temperature yeah. in there. And everything yeah, really nice. inside has been upgraded, and yeah. this glazing is triple glazed. Um, the we've we've put in our own recycled floorboards and, and yeah, redone nice. the insulation in, the, right. in some of the walls, yeah. and certainly in the, in the in the ceilings, etc. Yeah. The and best. there's even a, a, a compost toilet outside. Yep. Little garden toilet, yep. which is lovely. And yeah. our um, thermal mass stove, oh, because right. I didn't yeah. finish about the wood. One of the prime directors was for that to be part of our biodiversity plan, but of course we'll get yields from that wood. Yes, yeah. Um, and so, you know, we like to manage our wood so that we can sustainably harvest nice. timber yeah. and use it for the for the fire. And Andy's, and I have to say it's Andy's department, and he's extremely good at yeah, managing right. the woodlot Fantastic. and making sure that we burn efficiently and we burn the minimum yeah. amount of wood that we need to yeah, burn as well. Right. Yeah. All right, I'm going to follow you in here because it's okay. a narrow little walkway in through the hedge. So we've got a fairly conventional, as some people would see it, I expect. Turn um, around this way yeah, together. Bear there in mind, it's um, only just starting well, to get spring is. here. Well, that, as I said, it's pretty gold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we've got um, a conventional sort of organic four bed yeah. rotation yeah. really. So this is just kind of zone one garden isn't yeah, it? Yeah yeah it is it is. Yeah. And so I'm um, just starting to get it ready for planting now. Yeah we've got yeah. the potatoes in some of these beds. Yeah. Nice. Um, further down we've got the polytunnel because the polytunnel makes a big difference yeah. in this climate. Yeah. So what do you grow you know? mostly in your polytunnel? Well uh, in the winter a lot of winter salads. Yeah. Um, in the summer some of the conventional you know the, the thing with the wet climate is you tend to get blight right so okay. tomatoes uh, especially at our elevation mm. outside are a bit difficult yeah okay so things like tomatoes but i also love the self cedars yes right so like the sturgeon and the tree yeah, spinach yeah and that kind of thing yeah. i do grow a few peas and beans in yeah. there as well for early crops okay and yeah. you've got some grapes and kiwis yeah, as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, Self-fertile kiwi. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely. Should we keep going? Can yep. we go this way yep. right down to the your... Yep. Go and have a look at the espaliers. Oh, yeah, we're going round the block, aren't we? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Should we just have a peek in the in the in the house? Well, yeah, this is not this is not the oh, best no, as I, I would like of, it to be. But we can see lots of greens yeah. and there's some um, some rocket flowering yeah, and mustard and the great vines greens. just down to spread back just again. Yeah, yeah, and lovely. the tree spinach. Oh, there's a, a mallow that we've had for a long oh, right. time. Okay. Yeah, it makes a great little salad, and it's self-seeded, and it's a short-lived perennial. Yeah, yeah. I love. I mean, this is as much out here is as much annual beds as I would. I'm prepared to manage. Yeah, yeah. So everything else has to be self-seeding and yeah, or and perennial. perennial. Oh, no. Yeah, tree crops. Oh, yeah. we've got a beautiful spelly behind us here. Should we look at this one? Oh, yeah. Wow, look at all that beautiful flower. And just tell you, it looks so nice on the rock it wall. It does. And this is extra special. Right. Because the the first PDC I ever co-taught, yep. which culminated in the formation of the Lampard Permaculture yep. Group, they presented us all with a gift. Yep. And this, and this was the gift. Oh, my gosh. And yes. so beautiful. Yeah, so the pear tree. And these walls, uh, a lot of you know, Welsh farmhouses yep. like we live in and the yep. barns, have like 70 centimetre or wider oh, walls. Wow. So you've got a lot of thermal mass. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a south face. Perfect So, spot. you know, we really had to have that yeah. in order to be able to grow the yeah. range of things that we do. So there's a few more up here. So we keep going this Around way. Around the corner, yep. Right. And there's a rain butt here. 
I've never really heard that. And we always go in water tanks. I'm getting used yeah, to going yeah, in rain. Butts. Butts, yeah. but, <laughs> but is kind of a bit of a rude word. Like that, yeah. Yeah. Well, I've actually been training Monty not to say butts. <laughs> but <on. laughs> yeah, Six-year-olds like to talk about those kind of things. So this word, uh, we're walking towards what would have been a barn wall. And when we came, it was like in quite a bad, poor state of repair. Yeah, you can see it. And then so it's a part of a barn, but it's now a beautiful garden wall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. lovely. And we and had so to put it in the soil because it's, a, it's an old farmyard and it's very, very stony right. underneath. And so behind us over here, there's something very interesting in the middle of your grassy area here. Oh yes, Meadow. this. What is that? Well, it's apart from the Buddha's head. Can we get a bit closer Yeah, to let's it? get a little bit closer. Let's see if I can... And it's called a horse engine. Right, yeah. so the, there would have been sticks coming out attaching to Yeah, there horses. was a big crank. There, yeah. was a, there was a crank coming at the bottom, Yeah. right? So that went along. And at the top, they used to yoke up I think possibly two horses. It looks like it, doesn't it? Cause yeah. Got, yeah. And then that would have driven machinery that was in the barn. Right. And yeah. you don't know quite we, what it was. Unfortunately, would have... we don't know, but there were three mills in this village alone. Right. A wool and mill, you're saying? Ver yeah, various mills. Right. Okay. So it's possible that it was grinding up fodder yeah. for the animals. Because yeah. it's quite a... You, know, you imagine this without all of our windbreaks and everything. It's quite a harsh environment. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they would have had to winter the animals yeah. inside. Yeah, yeah. And that barn there with the solar panels on right. is, was the winter quarters for some of the animals. Right. It's a beautiful barn, isn't it? Yeah, it You've is. You've got quite a, quite a solar array up there yeah. too. And does that keep you going mostly? Or you yeah, well, we've, we've, um, because we're on the grid anyway, yeah. we're already on the grid. So the advice at the time was, you know, why, why number yourself with batteries etc yeah, yeah. so we choose to um, export yes so we were we were one of the early adopters yeah right so we got the solar array and I uh, and in our, our aim my aim is to use electricity as little as possible yeah, yeah, of course. because gradually over the years mm. the the renewable content of the UK mains electricity supply has increased yeah there's so many and that's around because, here, yeah really, so yeah. that's obviously some of the big boys yeah but a lot of home yeah, right. Production like this. Of course, they're everywhere. Yes. I'm really surprised, actually, because it's, you know, compared to Australia, it's almost comparable, and I wouldn't have thought there'd be so much uptake here because, yeah. you know, far less sun than Australia, but they're everywhere, yeah. absolutely everywhere. Yeah. Really well, you get brilliant. the right orientation. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's sad because our government has kind of, like, pulled the rug on it over the last couple yeah. of years. Yeah, that was a bit too. Um, yeah. And it would be nice if they kind of saw the light and yeah, decided yeah. that... Yeah, it, it's obvious that it's, we should be doing more of this, and yeah. particularly on community buildings, yeah. and particularly where the community gets the benefit. Yes, yep. You know, because some of those, you know, some people are very against wind farms. I'm not, as long as they're appropriately placed. Yes. But one of the things I do object to is the fact that they, they're often built by multinationals. They may yeah. be a, 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 another country that is yeah. benefiting, yeah. corporate that's benefiting yeah. from Wouldn't it make so much more sense to be local? Yeah. There's a big movement in Australia at the moment, actually, around community energy. And, um, yes, you know, same here. Yeah, great. Yeah. And I think that's a really huge thing that needs a lot more support, yeah. a lot more growth in that yeah. area. Yeah. yeah. And I guess the government wants fairly quick fixes, but, you know, community energy, as I understand it, is, you know, Andy and I have, have invested... I don't mean from a profiteering point of view, yep. but to help yes, a yes. community farm yeah. down in South Wales. Yep. And but they they take longer to come about because you've got to get the community on board. Yeah. But that that has lots of other benefits, yes, it doesn't does. it? Well, the ripple together. Effect, the ripple effect of that. Yes. Once you start to connect people on one thing, then yeah. it ripples out to so many other things. Yeah. And, and and yeah, things start to change. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think I'm almost frozen. Yes, <laughs> even I am. Even I am. <laughs> Keeping my hands in my oh, pockets. No. Well, thank you so much, for <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's um, lovely. It's lovely to, yeah. lovely to share it with you yeah, after all these years. Yeah, it's such a beautiful place. Yeah. And, and thank you so much for hosting us here. It's great. Yeah. It's great. Okay. Yeah. Cheers. See ya. Bye. <laughs>